Praise the Lord. That's good advice, isn't it? Everything. The first thing we do, right, we take it to Jesus, not the last. You know, sometimes we do that in our Christian experience. But the first thing we do is take everything to the Lord in prayer. And speaking of that, before we open the blessed pages of the Word of God, I'm going to kneel up here and uh, have prayer where you can. And those who are at home or those who are here with us today might want to kneel so we can pray together. Our kind, loving Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, your long-suffering. Father, I ask forgiveness of sin, anything in my heart and life that needs not be there. Lord, we need to hear from heaven today. You have a message for your people. It could be a warning message, a message of love, a message of encouragement. But Lord, you have a word. You're going to give it to us in due season. So we pray our hearts, our ears, and our minds will be open to receive that which you have for us today. We just ask your blessing, the power of thy Holy Spirit, now to consume each and every one of your children. We're going to give you praise, give you honor, and give you glory. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue where we left off last time. and We, I, we did not film it, and I think they're going to film it today, but this is the second part of a don't wait to make yourself better. Subject, don't wait to make yourself better. And for those who were not here, and maybe those who would like a little, little background on what we covered, praise God, it's always good to go back and say, we covered these areas, and it's a reminder to you and for each one of us, the points that we covered. Number one, I think a very important part when we're thinking in terms of don't wait to make yourself better, because I hear this all the time, when certain things get accomplished in life, then I'm going to make my decision for Christ. Oh, friend, that's, we can't do that. No. Make a decision for Christ first, and all these other things shall be added unto you. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. That's a promise that God makes. And I'm so thankful today, the point that we discussed last week was God is willing to receive the repenting sinner. The sinner. When a sinner comes to Christ and repenting of his sins, Christ is willing regardless of that life. If we come to Him, He's willing to forgive us. Thank God for that. Number two, God calls us to return to Him. God's always calling us to return to Him. Why? For He has redeemed us. He has redeemed us. He's giving a call. And as the sermon title says, point number three, don't wait until you're good enough. Just come to Jesus as you are. And He's going to take care of things for us. We covered another step I thought was very, very important, which is our first step in coming to Jesus is simply to, what, to repent of our sins. That goes along with step number five. We talked about repentance is produced by the influence of grace upon the heart. So praise God for the Spirit, right? That's always there working upon our hearts, bringing us to the point where we say, Lord, what? we want to repent of our sin. We want a new life in Him. Point number six, true repentance never makes an attempt to justify self. True repentance, what? Never makes an attempt to justify self. What do we mean by that quickly? Is that we've done something that's wrong, we never do what? We never try to justify it. See, if we make excuses for what we did or circumstances, I did this because uh, Brother Bobby said that's why I did See, we're making excuses. When we repent, there's no excuse. We bring it to the Lord in prayer, and God would be willing to forgive us. Number seven, last point. Unless a person yields to the power of the Holy Spirit, he will remain blind to his own sins. He will remain blind to his sins and will feel no need to repent. Praise God for the power of the Holy Spirit, right, that comes in and works in our heart and our mind. We feel a need to be cleansed, a need to change our hearts and our lives. Starting with part, with part number two, you have your Bibles. Turn with me to the book of John, please. John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verse 37. John 7, verse 37. Good. The Bible says, I love that every time someone says the Bible says, I listen. That's good. We should. The Bible says, right? Jesus says. The Word of God says. The Holy Spirit says, verse 37, it says, 
in the last day, that great day of what? The feast, Jesus did something. It said, He stood and He cried, saying, If any man, I like this verse, If any man, what? Thirst, Thirst let him come unto me and to drink. Most of you realize, not going to spend time on it. When you are thirsty, really, really thirsty, nothing hits it like some water. Right? You can drink other things, but when you really have a thirst, you want some water. Jesus stood up, and we're talking about this point in time. We'll discuss it in just a little bit more of what was going on. But Jesus stood up. Here was an opportunity for Jesus to stand for the people, what they were going through, what they were participating in, to make real sense to them. Jesus always took every opportunity that was afforded Him to get the attention of the people. There's things like that that happen in your life and mine. Those are open doors. Those are opportunities that we have to be aware of. When the people are thinking a certain way, there's a chance to put in some truth of God's Word. And Jesus was always aware of that. What was taking place at that point in time when it says in, in the last day? Did you get that? Uh, meant, meant what? In the last great day of the feast that they were talking about. It was the feast of tabernacles that they were participating in. Okay, the feast of tabernacles. That's in Leviticus 23. It says, Jesus stood, and I like it, it said he did what? He cried. Is there something I need to change, honey? Okay, well, if you see it on there, say we'll try to adjust or do what we need to do. It said, Jesus stood, he cried, saying, Any man thirst, let him come unto me and to drink. That, to me, is an invitation. Now, how many of us like invitations? We all like invitations, right, of coming, you know, maybe a party or going someplace and somebody gives you an invite. And, you know, very seldom do we ever turn those invitations down. And Jesus loves us and He's always inviting us to come. Amen. Anybody that is thirsty. Now remember, you need to be thirsty or you will not go to the well. You have to be thirsty or you won't go to the faucet even for the physical water. Jesus was offering them much more than the physical water. Notice the Bible talks about in Isaiah 55, 1. Just jot them down. We've got to move quickly. Another invitation is given. It says, Every one that thirsteth, huh, come ye to the waters. It's always interesting that if you're thirsty, he says, then you have to come to the water. There's got to be an effort put forward. That's what God is talking to His children. Are you thirsty? Then you need to come and to drink of the water. Come ye, and this, notice this, Isaiah 41, 18. He said, I will make the wilderness a pool of what? Of water. And the dry land spring up of water. Right, Jesus was talking about, you know, talking about in the wilderness of where he made water come out of a rock. Interesting. So he said in the wilderness it's going to be you know, a dry and there's no water. But he said he's going to make it a spring of water. And interesting how he's the spiritual aspect of this should grasp or get a hold of the Christian today. And remember, you need to be thirsty. When you come to church, we need to be hungering for the what? The Word of God. See, so often we come and we think that we're full. Maybe we don't need anything else in our life. Interesting, Jesus never asked those of their, uh, uh, some of you probably don't need to hear this, and some of you, you know, just ignore it. He never said that at all. He stood up and he cried with a loud voice, saying what? Everybody there needed something. That's all of us today. There will never come a time in your walk with Christ or mine on this earth, there will never come a time that we don't need that living water. There will never is a time that we should never be thirsty. Now remember, unless you're thirsty, you don't want to drink and you will, won't go where the water's at. See, so the people today, I have to then surmise, may I do that, that some wasn't, they weren't thirsty today. There were circumstances, maybe situations, and maybe some the Lord understands, and others may just be laziness. Or they're not thirsty. They don't need to come to the well because they're feeling pretty good about themselves. Very interesting. I never see that in the Word of God that there comes a time when you feel real good about yourself and you don't need anything else. You know, the closer I get to the Lord, the more I see that I need Him. Right? And really, the more you drink, the more you thirst, you thirst and you want to drink some more. Right? And that's what the Bible says. He said, I'll make that wilderness. And some, you know what? That's in our, our life. There's a wilderness. There's dry spots that we have. 
And God says, I want to water those dry spots for you. I want to give you something that will last not just for now, but for eternity. Interesting, in John 4, 14, the Bible says, we'll look at that rather quickly, John 4, 14. The Bible says, a water that I shall give him shall be a well of water doing what? Springing up into everlasting life. John 4, 14. What was Jesus telling them? The water that I shall give you. Now remember, when he's talking about water, and the people always, you know, in the wilderness, in their exodus experience, they were always having water problems. Wherever they went, because they were in what? The wilderness, they were in a desert place, there wasn't really water around, and Jesus performed miracle after miracle. It's kind of interesting, a lot of people have said to me, they said, well, you know, uh, we, we focus on that one time that Moses struck the rock twice, when God said to speak to it, and we kind of focus on that, and that's where the water came forth, and that was it. You realize several instances in the Bible that it talks about wherever that they ended up in their travel, water came out of the rock. It wasn't just one place, but that one was brought forward. And uh, uh, maybe I can call your attention to some of that a little bit later on when you look in the book of, of Exodus and so on and so forth. But I thought how interesting that was, that God, wherever they ended up, God was there. Whenever they needed water, He had water for them. When there was no water, He developed water. He made water. It came forth. Interesting. The Bible says this water, and I like to think that word there, if you look at the, the meaning of it, it means life-giving. The water that He wants to give us. Remember, it's not just this glass of water you're talking about here. Certainly, He always met the physical. You notice that? Didn't, when people came to Him? When Jesus walked this earth, did He meet the physical? Yeah, I would say if someone come to him and say, I'm thirsty, I haven't had a drink in, in, in two or three days, that Jesus would make sure that that man had a glass of water first, and then he would offer him something else. See, offer him something else. And, you know, we think in terms of that when people come here and they ask for, just like the man, Travis, and we was in the class, and when he come in, he, he asked for help. See, he wanted to feel, my first inclination was I wanted to help him spiritually. But you see what? He needed, or it seemed he needed certain some finances to help him to get some other things off of his mind first, but we may never have the opportunity to further that. We pray that the Spirit of the living God will work upon his heart and upon his mind. So the water then that Jesus said, it's life-giving. Now Jeremiah talked about that life-giving water too in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. In fact, he, he, called Jesus, he called Jesus the fountain of living water. Is Jesus a fountain of living water? Does He just have a little pond? Or does He have an ocean full of water? What did he said He's the fountain of living water. Praise God for that. And then Isaiah spoke in Isaiah 12 verse 3. It said, therefore with joy. How many of us really go to the well with joy? How many of us open the Bible of a morning with real joy? How many of us really thirsty when we get up for the Word of God and we really want to get into it and we're just excited? And, and therefore, with joy, Isaiah said, shall you draw water out of the well of salvation. We're drawing what? Spiritual water out of the what? The well of salvation. So there's something important here about water, water of life, salvation, spending time with Jesus here, the living fountain, a fountain that shall never run dry. And interesting, in the, in the new heaven and the new earth, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 1, the Bible talks about there a river. Just think about it, a pure river of water. And what is it called? The river of life in what? In the new Jerusalem, the new earth it's talking about here. There's still that river of, of life, that pure water it's talking about here. It's interesting. And it says what? It's proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. Where does, the, where does everlasting life, where does it come from? Yeah, the throne room of God. That's where from God, from, from Jesus. The sacrifice that was made. And in the new earth, it's still bringing us back to that concept. If anyone's thirsty, he needs to come and drink. And where, where, where's that? Where's salvation? From Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Never thirst. I like to think about that because I can relate to many of you can about really being hot and thirsty. You know, physically. And how, how nothing else, you, you can't get anything else on your mind until you get a drink. If you've ever been hungry or thirsty. Yeah. Nothing, and people talk about other stuff and you, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But you're thinking about, I need that water. I need a drink. I need some food. 
that never thirst. I thought, how interesting that subject. If you look at that word and kind of look at that never thirst, it says, shall not thirst unto the ages. Well, Jesus was offering them water. Listen, the water that he had to offer them, you would never thirst again. You didn't have to go back and drink and drink and drink. The one he offered was what? To last for eternal or the ages, it said here. Notice that. Or forever. Interesting. Now we go back, I realize, and we get into the water and we drink of it now. Rivers of living water. It makes me thirsty now to think about it. See, the physical. But how about the spiritual? Always the spiritual. I think about a person possibly you know, living for Christ. He becomes a real power, a, a quickening spirit, you know, quickened by faith we can see. What does he do? When he, when he catches that vision of being with Christ and he, he, he steps out in faith, he also becomes quite a what? He, he carries this water of life with him because he has it taken in. And he starts sharing it with others. He's an encouragement to others. He's offering them e eternal life. Have you been offering anyone eternal life lately? Have you been giving them something a little less? They, they, they're hungering, they're thirsting after something. Have you really been offering them that which they may not even realize they need it? You see? But we have to take the time as Jesus did at this certain time of the feast that he stood up and he cried, you know, if anybody's thirsty, come on. I think back of the, the uh, smitten rock. Do you remember at Horeb? Kind of interesting, they gave Israel fresh water to, to drink. That's in uh, Exodus 17 where this takes place. And here, notice, interesting, Jesus told him in Exodus 17, He told Moses, listen to me, He told him to smite the rock. See, because again, people think it just happened one time, but this time He said to smite the rock. He said, take that, remember, the, He had, hit, had his, uh, the rod that He had that parted the the, the Red Sea, remember? Parted, open back. He said, take that and you smite the rock this time. It's kind of interesting, and, and you read that in Exodus 17. So wherever they stopped, there was water for them in the clefts of the rock. In Exodus chapter 15, do you remember? The children of Israel said, oh, we're thirsty again. This was at another place, and what happened? They went to get, the, there's some water there, but it was bitter, and they couldn't drink it. And God told Moses, he said, take that, see that tree over there? Take that tree and throw it into the water, and that bitter water will become sweet. Now, you think there was something in that tree or the leaves of that tree that really just affected that whole whatever pond or little lake, whatever it was there? Or was it a matter of obedience? obedience. Matter of obedience. They went and took what God had said, put it in there, the water became sweet, and they were able to, to drink that water. And then in Numbers 20, it talks about then again... This is where God said to Moses, because the children of Israel said what? We're out here two or three days. We have no water to drink. Better that we stayed in Egypt. Right? Well, we're going to die out here. We're going to have to perish out here if there's no water. And God did what? It's all we said. You said we said a while ago, the special music, you know, take our needs and things to, to the Son, right? To Jesus. And the first thing Moses did was ask God. said, these people here, they're about to, they're going to stone me. They're going to turn on me. There's no water. And there's where God said to, to Moses, he told Moses, he said, Go and speak to the rock this time. Not strike it, but speak to it, and it shall be so. What was Moses' problem? You think obedience is not important? It's very important because Moses not only didn't, he did not speak to the rock, but he struck the rock. And you know what? He struck it twice. And he said, Must we? Always bring forth. Must we do this? Now the last thing that God wanted for Moses to do and for us today is take credit for what God is doing. Does that make sense? This is quite a lesson for those who are standing up and said, oh, all this good stuff comes through me. We're, we're so good and the ministry is so wonderful. Here, Never take credit for anything that goes good. It's God that gives it. And because He did these two things. Now remember, Jesus had to die how many times? Just one time, Moses struck the rock twice, signifying what? Huh? Most of number one, disobedience to God because he didn't speak to it like God said, and he did it twice. 
So God said, because you did. Now this was a, this was a man that God spoke to. This was a man that was a righteous man. God didn't say that Aaron was a righteous man. He was a high priest. But what did he say? I'll talk to you, Moses, and you tell, you tell Aaron. But because Moses did not obey Jesus, and you say, well, I don't want to obey to the letter. You need to listen to what God says. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is important. It's a challenge. And never take credit for what God is, is doing. Always give Him the praise for it. So how interesting it is. He said, Moses, and of course even Aaron, you can't, you can't go into the promised land. You're not going to go because you disobeyed my voice. Because you let on to the people as though the miracles that are happening came from man rather than from the God who is leading. You see how it is? God, God understands these things and He says you can't go. They disobeyed. In fact, they're all going to have to die weren't they, except for a couple of them. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4 it says, they drank of that spiritual, what? Of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was what? Good. The rock was Christ. Some people forget that, that when Moses, listen to me, when, Ma, when Moses struck the rock, he was in essence striking whom? Jesus. And not just one time, but he struck him twice. Because that rock represented Jesus Christ. Isaiah said it, right? Jeremiah said it. New Testament talks about it. He's the rock, the rock of our salvation. Psalms talks about it over and over and over about it. He's the rock. And Moses said, must we? And he struck it twice. We have to be very, very careful. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was who? Christ. Was Christ. The smitten rock then represented Christ. The water that flowed out of the rock. Listen. The water that flowed out of the rock represented the blood that would flow out of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins and give us eternal life. He was talking about the water, was spiritual water, wasn't he? Here Jesus talking about his blood. See, that represented Jesus Christ. Moses rose up against that and said, must we? You know what the Bible says in Isaiah 55? It says, there, it says Jesus was, listen, Jesus was smitten of God. Prophecy said he would be smitten of God. And I thought, oh, what a word, smitten of God. Jesus, you know what that word smitten means? It means that Jesus Christ would be slaughtered. It makes you sad, doesn't it? it made me sad when I read that. That Jesus Christ would be slaughtered for somebody like me. That Jesus Christ would be, the other word, it means he would be beaten for me. He would be wounded for me. He would be killed for me, slaughtered in my place. Isaiah 53, 4, read it. He was nailed to the cross for our sins. There that streams of blood flowed. And I want to say that living water. That blood for the salvation of the lost world. Hebrews 9, 28 says, He, Christ, was once offered to bear the sins of what? So we see the significance. He was what? How many times? He was once offered to bear the sins. Twice. Disobedient. The rock was smitten. You see. This rock, Jesus Christ, was smitten one time. And out came that life flowing blood. Interesting, we just talked about Israel celebrated... The flowing of the water. See, there was a time that they were told that they was going to celebrate that, that water that would come out of the rock. And so they got together. They had a specific time. It actually lasted for seven days celebration. They didn't want the people to forget. And that's, listen, that's after they arrived in Canaan. So how many people were, you know, in Canaan that was out in the wilderness? It was only, we, 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 what, was, was it Joshua and Caleb? There's the two, and then what, 20 years and younger. And the Bible says, it's interesting how they, it says those who didn't know the difference between good and evil. 
The only ones that got to go in there was two grown-ups, and the rest of them they called them was younger people who didn't know the difference between good and evil God had mercy on. Is that what it says in time of ignorance that he winks at? That means of times of not knowing. We think we know something, and God doesn't hold it against us while we're still learning and still growing, but there still is the truth to the issues. So how interesting. Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated after they arrived in Canaan land. Interesting. Seven days. Here's what happened. Every day then water would be drawn into a golden vessel. So the priest would then would go out and they would draw water in these golden vessels. There was music that was playing all over the place. All kind of music. All kind of singing. I'm sure it was beautiful. Quite a celebration and remembrance of the rock that provided and the rock that would continue to provide for them. And so the music was going and the, the songs were being uh, sung. And then they would take that water and they would bring it in. And that water was poured out on the altar of burnt offerings. That water was poured out. Huh. Now listen. While they were doing this. And somebody get this. While they got the water. While there was music. While there was celebration going on was the time that Jesus came when they took the water and they poured it on the altar of sacrifice is the moment that got silent and Jesus stood up and said what? If any man thirst, he said, let him come unto me and drink. John 37 that we read. What a golden opportunity, what a time for Jesus to stand and to speak when they were going through all of this to remind them and what had taken place. And he said, come to me. He's the rock. Wow. Isaiah 26, and you have to look in the margin if you have a King James Version. You can see that, you know, what, you know how Isaiah described him? He said, and we sing it, Jesus is the rock of ages. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Isaiah knew about this. The prophets knew about this. And in your or the Bible, it may say everlasting strength, but translated, it means rock of ages. Israel had a hard time to receive, you see. They had a hard time to receive all that Christ wanted to do for them. They couldn't see clearly for some reason. Desire of Ages, page 456, makes this comment. Please listen. One of the best books I've ever read on the life of Christ. It says, like Israel, the Jews, the Pharisees, had not put their will on the side of God's will. How important is it for to put our will on the side of Christ's will? It's, it's eternal life, isn't it, right? The only thing we have to do in the gift of plan of salvation is to give Him our will. Think about it. Give Him our will. We do that daily, aren't we? Or put, on, put ourselves on the side of, of God's will, on the side of Christ. Notice, they were not. Here was the problem with Israel and the Jews. They were not wanting to really, seeking to know what truth is. But they were looking for some kind of an excuse. Did you get it? For evading it. Interesting. Are there people like that maybe today? There are people who are looking for excuses why they not, don't have to do anything. Or they shouldn't do anything. The Jews of old, the Pharisees, this is exactly what they did. They understood it. They heard it. They read it. But then they began to find a way to try to, so well, they didn't have to do any of these things. Excuses. Christ showed that this was why he did not. They did not understand his teachings. Now remember, they did. The teachings were clear. A little child could understand it, but the many could not because they were looking for excuses not to. And the article goes on and says, "So is genuine repentance and humiliation in searching out truth. No excuses can be made. No self-justification for our actions." Kind of interesting. Paul gives some examples here. Let's try to cover a few as we can. I like it where you can go and you can read and you can find illustrations or examples in scriptures to know that we're, on, right, we're, we're, we're learning what God wants us to, to learn here. This is when we talk about repentance and humiliation, a broken spirit, a humble spirit when you're truly sorry, a teachable spirit, wanting to know what is right and do the right thing. As Paul met Jesus Christ, he began to understand a little more about Calvary. And as he understood Calvary and what he had cost, he made no excuses. We talked a little bit about it just for a few moments last time. He made no excuses for his mistakes or his sins. Remember, the person that makes excuses for what they've done is they're not really sorry for it. 
But notice how Paul covers that. Acts chapter 26. If you'll turn with me. Acts chapter 26. Let's read it. I think it's important that we read this together. Acts chapter 26. Do we believe that Paul was a converted individual? Do we believe that he was a changed individual? Yes, absolutely. So notice how he handled it. Because Paul was a sinner. Isn't that right? Like the rest of us. He had a lot of issues, a lot of things he was responsible for that were not Christ-like before his conversion. But notice how he handled it after he met Jesus. And this is the way that we should handle it as we have met Jesus. Acts chapter 26, verse 10. It says, Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison. What did Paul say? Was he responsible for putting people in prison? Yes, he was. Huh? Was he? Yeah, he said, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. So what, simply he was standing up, what? Taking responsibility for what he did. He didn't make excuses. Well, I did this because that's why I got paid for it. Or the priest told me to do it. Or somebody else said, I need to do it this way. He didn't do that. In order to really be repentant and to humble and for God to forgive us, we need to, what? Be responsible. For our actions. And he was. He said, I, I did these things. How interesting. How many of us today always use somebody else for a reason? So often in the church, people quit going because they, they got mad at the pastor. Pastor made them mad. He said something they didn't like. They may have been going for 10 years and probably never did upset them. But the one time he said one thing that crossed their path, they were done. They're not going to go back anymore. Or somebody at the church didn't say hi. Somebody didn't say bye. They got their feelings hurt. And they left. Always making excuses. Rather than, did Paul, you never see in Scripture what kind of man, what he did. He put, he put people to death. He was responsible. He put them in prison. He tore families apart. They'd never be reunited again. You could never replace it. How much forgiveness that you have, the God of heaven can forgive us of those things, but it didn't put the family back together that he separated and killed. What a merciful God, much more than what we can comprehend sometimes, His forgiveness, how wonderful it is. Paul was quick to say in 1 Timothy 1.15, 1 Timothy 1.15, he said, here's Christ Jesus, He came into the world to save sinners. What a message for today, for God's people. Jesus Christ, He came into this world to save what? Sinners. sinners. Now, here's where we need to man up, they say, Right? Here's where we need to come to grips with it. Paul said it. He said, of whom I am chief. Most of us say, he came in the world to save sinners. And we start looking at everybody else. Ooh, uh, never do any of that. Oh, you, can you believe these people? He didn't make excuses. Everybody knew it. How many of us would be so thrilled today if it were living in that day? And Paul would walk through the, the doors and come and sit down in your sanctuary, in your, in your temple. And you're thinking, oh no, he's here to try to get rid of me. How many of us would have had doubt if that man came in after we knew all his responsible persecuting, killing Christians? How many would take him at face value, would be afraid of him? He could have made excuses, but he did not. He said, I'm the chief, I'm the foremost, I'm the worst, is what that word means, in time and in place and in order. He was the chief. And I don't know about you, but there's times in my life I feel like that. Every time I come to him asking for forgiveness, it's, I'm, I'm the chief. And the Bible is clear, there's none good, no, not one, so why not be honest about this thing? Please remember, when your confession will not be acceptable to God without sincere repentance. And then a reformation or a change take place. So when we say we're sorry, oh, please forgive us, you know, except we've got God, there needs to be what? A reformation and a change that follows that. There must be a decided change in the life. What does that mean? Everything, listen carefully, everything that is offensive to God must be put aside. If we really say we're sorry for something, right? We've done something wrong because the Bible has said that it's wrong. Then we must be willing to put it aside and turn away from that. Genuine repentance. Put away. Genuine repentance means sorrow for sin. Have you ever seen anybody give their heart to Jesus and the big old tears are coming down their cheek? They get up front, they, they give their life to Christ and, and they're repenting of their sins. They say, God has forgiven me of my sins. You know, they're, they're totally sorry 
They're humbled by it. And you say, well, yeah, but a lot of people get up and they can cry. That's right, they can do that. But you know what? These people are making changes. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 says, what? notice this, but ye sorrow to repentance. You sorrow to repentance. They were sorry for what they'd done. And that means what? When you sorrow, that means you're under, dis dis you're under distress. Something's going on in, in your life. You're, you're sad. You're full of grief. That's what sorrow really means here. There's a heaviness to be made sorry. That's what it's talking about here. So when we really do something that you know, we know we shouldn't do, and we say, I'm so sorry, that means by the grace of God it's not going to happen again, isn't it? Why? Because it's breaking our heart. We're sorry that we said it. We're really sorry that we've done it. And by God's grace, it's not going to happen again. That's what come about. Forgiveness, right? Repentance, and then what? A change in our lifestyle. Wish we had a lot more time because Paul talked about that in, in 2 Corinthians 7 11 when he talked about his church members. He said this very quickly. He said, You sorrow after a godly sorrow. You sorrow after what? A godly sorrow. So there's that, that right there right, right tells you right quick. There's, all, there's other people sorrow from this, but it has to be a godly sorrow. Enough again to forgive and to move on. And he said, so, all, so that you're clear in this matter. Good example of this quickly. In the days of Samuel, in Samuel, 1 Samuel verse eight, uh, chapter 8, 18 through 22. We won't read it, but you need to get it down. It's interesting. You remember in the days of Samuel, what did the people want? God said, I want to be, I want to be, I want to be your, your leader. I want you to follow me. What did the people say they wanted? They said, we want a king. God's willing to be king. He's willing to be the leader. And the people had, the, we say, audacity to say what? Oh, no, 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 no. We want to have a king. Why? Because all the other nations have kings. This is a Christian, a child of God. Why do you want to be like the rest of the world? See, why do, we want, why do we look at the rest of the world and say, this is what we pattern ourselves after? When you look at the world, we, as a Christian, we should not be patterning ourselves in the way that we dress, the way that we talk, what we eat, the way we speak, the way we conduct ourselves. It should be nothing like the world does it. If you don't understand that, if I don't understand that, just say, well, I don't, I don't. just see how the world does this and just say, ooh, that's, I'm not sure what it is, but since the world does it, I, I'm, I'm not going that route. Think about it. Does it make sense? Godly sorrow. Get, be, we want to be like the rest of the nations. Kids go to school today. They don't want to dress too much differently because other ones will laugh at them. Oh, the rest, oh my, we don't want one of our babies to be laughed at. Oh, it would be a horrible nightmare. I know some of you, I got chuckled out all the time because we didn't hardly have any good stuff to wear. It's all right. It came out all right. I would have fit in perfectly today. Today, because of all the holes in my socks and in my pants and my shirt, no buttons. I told you, nobody can make a, a shirt like my mother. We never get to get a button shirt. Nobody can make one like mother. No one could do it as fast as mother could do it. She can make me a shirt in 15 minutes. I've not seen anything like it in my life. Now I will say this. One collar would be down about two inches longer than the other, but I tell you, I still had a collar. I look and I wonder, why is this collar down here and the other one way up here? She say, honey, I ran out of buttons. Don't worry about it. You got enough on there. Go on. We learn just go on. I'm just saying this. But you know, the, the world, we don't need to worry how the world is doing. Remember, if we're dressing like the world is dressing, something's wrong. I mean, it has to be. I'm not trying to be critical of that, but I'm just saying if the world is doing it and the worldly mind, look at the person that you're maybe copying after. Is it Hollywood? Yeah. What is it? Thank you. Yeah, the lack of. Friend, it's, in, it's important that we be different. Not like they said here, we want a king like the other nations. Instead of God leading us. See, how could, listen, how could this nation, how could Israel say, give us a worldly king? Give us a king that we can see. We're tired of God, evidently. How could they have come to that point? Hmm? Because, listen, you know what song says? I've wandered far 
away from God. But now I'm coming home. Israel, even though contact was there, could be every day, every moment. They wandered far enough away from God. They didn't know the difference between right and wrong. You think that's almost impossible, but think of the days that we've wandered away from God. It could be just for a day, dear friends, and it'll be a mistake you wished, you wished you never had made, and you can't get it back. They wandered so far away that they lost the knowledge of God, the ability of God, the power of God in their life to rule them as a nation, to take care of them, to defend them. God said, I'll fight all you what? All your battles for you. Wouldn't you like that today? See the miracles that all took place and then the leader come before you, Moses or Aaron, whoever it might be, and say, God has said that I will fight the battles for you. You don't need to fight anymore. I will do it. I will prepare a way when there seems to be no way. That's when God begins to shine. When there seems to be no hope. When there seems to be there's no way. Why? Because I figured out every little angle there could possibly be. Do you ever feel like that sometime? Well, I, I, I went through every little thing, and boy, I just don't know how God can do this thing, because I went all through it. We hadn't even scratched the surface. He'll make sure He picks a way that didn't go through your mind to show you He's God. Power and ability. But then they made a choice. Israel made a choice. And you know what? As soon, listen, as soon as they made that choice, they began to suffer. As soon as you throw God out of your life when you know better, you begin to suffer. Things begin to happen. It may be a little time in between, but there'll be consequences. It's important. There's consequences to pay. And you know what? Listen, this, before they finally found peace, all kind of things happened to them when they chose a, a, a leader ahead, a human being, rather than God. They had, didn't have peace for a long time. There was a mess going on in war. There was loss. There was death. All kind of... Before they found peace with God, they came to this point. Of making a definite confession. There had to be a definite confession. You know what they said? 1 Samuel 12, 19. This is how they confessed. They said, We have added unto all of our sins huh, and this evil to ask us a king. God began to bless when they came to the point where they said, now all of this stuff has come upon us and we just, one deal after the other's come upon us, we need to get back. Where did we go wrong? When did the blessing cease? And they went back and said, when we asked for a human being to, to rule over us, and they went back and they said, oh God, please forgive us. We know we've added to our sin when we asked for a king. Interesting, the very sin which they were convicted had to be confessed. Did you get it? The very sin which convicts us it has to be, we have to confess that sin in order to have that peace. Then they had to begin to act in harmony with their confession and their prayers. See, we, we can pray it right, but then we have to do what? So order our life in harmony with those. You remember when the Amorites, when they came against them, they made a plea for God's help. See, Israel wasn't really... Would we say that there, there was a, a nation that was trained to fight and had an army and all that kind of... You could say they had an army, but they weren't really trained fighters. They weren't like a lot of these other countries. They could fight and they had a little bit. That, that wasn't what God didn't want them to say, I'll go to battle because we can win it because we're tough and we're, we're strong. God wanted to show His power. And so when they were getting ready to get into conflict with the Amorites, they asked God for help. You know what they said? They said, we have sinned against thee, as they were forsaken. We have sinned against thee because we have, number one, forsaken our God. And also, we have served Balaam. What did they do? They confessed their sin. The sin was they had forgotten God, and they began to serve Balaam, Judges 10.10. 10. And before God began to move to help his people, then, right then, you know what? Confession and prayer, listen, confession and prayer had to be acted on. Interesting. This kind of leads us down a road some people don't want to go. So what happened? When they said we begin to serve Balaam, right? Scripture tells us they put away all those strange gods from among them and they begin to serve God. 
Then God began to work marvelously for them. But you have Judges 10, 16. You can read it for yourself. We want blessings. We want God to be blessed. We want, we want to be what He wants us to be. But there's ways that He said, this is how it comes about. So that you can have a peace. So that I can bless you. Oh well, friend, don't think to make yourself, you know, make yourself better before you come to Him. Don't think I can put it off and when I get it right, I can come to you. Because this could happen to you. I, I mentioned just a moment ago. Let me read you just a little paragraph here that I found. I thought it was very interesting. 2T308 says, In one single hour, listen, this hit, in one single hour, you may take a course which will afterward cost you bitter tears of repentance. You can think back in your life that you've probably, at one time or the other, you made a choice, and maybe many, that you, after it was all said and done, you wished you hadn't have done it. It cost you a lot of tears and a lot of sorrow. Tears of repentance. By yielding to temptation, you may alienate and estrange a heart from you. You lose the respect and the esteem you have been acquiring from those around you. Also, you, you have a stain on your Christian character. One time you let loose. One time you yield to temptation, as it were. And you know what? All the people that your you know, life that you're around that they respect and they, they love and so on and so forth, you lose all that by one act, one deed. You lose all of that respect and esteem and there's a stain on that Christian character. Now can Christ clean those stains? Yes. yes, He can. But you know in this life, even though it can be covered, you know what? Carry sometime, you carry those. Like Jesus will always carry what? He will carry his, his, the scars. That's what sin cost. Throughout eternity, He will carry the... I, I can't even, I can't imagine my poor mind. I just, what, what a wonderful Savior that we have. They're so willing to identify with humanity that He'll always be in the flesh. For all eternity. And we'll be able to see those scars. And there will always be a reminder that we don't want it, that to happen to him again or to us. It's not going to happen. Sin will not rise up the second time. Quickly, what would happen if it, we're talking true repentance? What if it's not true repentance? Do you remember God told Israel he said, when, in Canaan land, right? The last he said, go up and, go, go and take it. In the Canaan land. Hmm. In Deuteronomy 1, you can read that, Deuteronomy 1, 18 through about 21. God told Israel, go on, go on and take. And what did they say? Yes, we will. Or No, there's things up there we don't understand, man. There's giants, there's all kinds of stuff going on. We're not going to go up there. You know what that cost them? It cost them 40 years in the wilderness. It cost them, listen, one, somebody's not going to get it. I don't know if I should even mention it. Should I just mention it? That's what I'm, see, and, and in my own mind, it's just like it hits me at different times to say, oh, oh, how important every decision that you make and every decision that I make can cost us. They were right there on the verge. They could see the land of Canaan, the milk and honey, everything was theirs just for the taking. God said, go up. He promised them. He said, you can take it. I'm going to go before you. It's yours. Just walk up there and do it. And they looked around and said, oh, there's things we go. Oh, we can't do that. And they didn't do it. And it cost them 40 years in the wilderness. And all of them would die. We talked about but two. And the younger people who were, didn't know good from evil. Now that's quite a bit for one act of disobedience. You, th you need to think about the kind of God that we serve and what He's asking us. Huh. Israel then began to complain and they began to murmur against that decision. And because they complained and murmured, God gave them what they really wanted. He put them back into the wilderness. Listen, here's what could have happened. I am assured, if they had confessed their sins, are you still with me? When it was laid out for them, the sentence would have been changed. There was time. It was laid out that they were doing the wrong thing, that God told them that you need to go do it. If they had said, had first said, no, we're not going to go, and then they'd change their mind and said, yes, Lord, we're going to be obedient, the sentence would have been changed. They could have went and taken Canaan. But they did not do that. They didn't repent of rebelling against God. 
You know what they, you know what they murmured against? The judgment. Now what does that mean? Like most of us, when we get caught, that's what we murmur and complain about. Not that we did wrong, but we got what? Caught. We're sorry. Oh, man, I wish this had never happened. Man, I wish I hadn't got caught. Person's not sorry. When they say that, you can't possibly be sorry. What are they sorry? Yeah, sorry for the judgment. Sorry for having to pay the price. Price to pay. So we see here their repentance was not really true repentance. And therefore their sentence then could not be removed or reversed. But matters got worse. I'm looking at the clock. Matters got worse. Can you believe that it's going to get worse after this? Sometimes you wonder in your own life, right? Surely it can't get any worse than this. Well, hang on. I'll tell you, we need to keep our hand in the hand of Jesus or it's going to get worse. I'm telling you, it's going to get when God said, remember, when He said, go, they didn't go. Now, because they didn't go, God understood that what? Then He could not fight the battle for them, and if they went on their own, that they would be defeated, and thousands of lives would be lost. And so God tells them right after that, just read the whole chapter we we're talking about. God said to the Israel, you know what He said? He said, now I want you to retreat. Think about that if you're on the side of God, and God says to retreat. How sad. Because I've always said marching orders, you go forward. But because they disobeyed him, he said, I want you to retreat now and to fall back. Interesting, huh? Some of them begin to say, you know what? We fouled up the first time that we didn't go. Somebody stay with me. We didn't go when God said go. He says retreat now, but let's, let's make it up to him. What do you say? Let's go take it. Let's go take it. Interesting. Yeah. You know what they said? They said, now we're going to go forward and now we're going to fight the battle. Yeah. We, and he never, ever said fight. He said, go and I'll fight it for you. God never intended, listen, to take the land of milk and honey by force. It was a gift from God. That's salvation. It was a gift from God and he wanted to give it to them. They rejected it. And now they look around and say, oh boy, this is blowing up in our face. Let's take it. Let's go and fight like God said. They had got so far away from God, they didn't even understand what he said. Huh. Listen, two wrongs, too heavy duty, and you could break them down however you want to. They said, let's go when God said no. Two wrongs here. Number one, Satan won two battles here. Two big battles here. Number one, he prevented Israel from going into the land of Canaan. Did he not? He put it off for another 40 years. How sad. See, I feel we're on the brink of Canaan land, spiritual, heaven. And the devil's trying to make sure that we're not there. He's going to try to postpone it for as long as he can. He's going to make sure we're all busy in things of this world and maybe even family and things that are good all is right here. But our mind's not stayed upon Christ. We're doing other things. We're putting things first. We don't mean to put them first. We don't mean to put things before God. We don't mean to put things before our study. We don't mean to put it before a prayer meeting. We don't mean to put it before Sabbath school. We don't mean to put it before preaching service. We don't mean to all this right here, but nevertheless, that's still our actions. That's still our heart. We don't mean to do it, but it happens. We make that choice. God understands it. What? And the devil prevents us from what? Getting ready for, for the kingdom of God. He did, these are for examples. Is that what the Bible said? These are examples that we're going over that we can learn from. Number two. He encouraged them to go forward when God said retreat. See, it's always, remember, it's always the opposite. The devil will always do the opposite of what God says something. The devil will always go the opposite. Interesting. Retreat. Read that. Deuteronomy 141. You can read it. See, how blind had these people become? How blind have we become? Yeah. Please remember, remember, God had never said go and fight in this battle. Not this one. Never by warfare. Just as we can't earn salvation today. We can't fight our way into the kingdom. But you know what? You know what Canaan was given to them on condition of obedience. As long as they obeyed, he fought it for them. When they refused and rebelled, what? Oh, they, uh, it is a sad, sad scenario for them. 
And then they had to come back and end up repenting of what took place. Finally, they said, you know what they finally said? We have sinned. They were, I want to say this nicely, they were beat senseless. They went ahead, they went on up to fight the battle. Thousands and thousands of lives were lost. Interesting. Remember what God told them to begin with? Before all this took place, He said, I want you to retreat and you're going to go into the wilderness. They said, hmm, we had rather die than go back into the wilderness. So therefore, we're going to go fight like you said, which He hadn't said. Now think about what they were doing. We're going to take it. We're going to go up there and we're going to kill it. The enemy was located on such a high plane that they were, we call them sitting ducks. As Israel went up, they picked them off one after the other after thousands were lost. You know what happened? There was nothing left for Israel to do. Listen, God already told them what they were supposed to do. They did not do it. They disobeyed. They got beat, got whipped, got knocked back. And you know one of the only places that they could continue to exist? Thank you. They went to the wilderness. Exactly where God said they were supposed to go. And if they had went, that wouldn't have happened. To retreat, to go back. But they ended up exactly where God said they would be, to the wilderness. If they hadn't, the enemy would have come, come upon them. Now what does the enemy say as we close? Think about this. What did the enemy say? You realize the enemy of Israel? You realize that they, they were afraid of Israel, even though they weren't called having a big army and they couldn't fight like other nations? Why were, why were other nations afraid of Israel? Because they said they serve some God, something up there that works miracles, and we have seen it. We are afraid to attack them. And Israel, what is the time we're talking about, they weren't attacked because the nations were afraid of them. They shook in their boots, the Bible said. They were knee smote once against the other. But when Israel disobeyed and they went up and they saw how easy it was to de destroy Israel, you know what? They begin to pick. They're going to pick on Israel then. And they said what we thought was miracles and what we thought was the God of heaven, the God that's different than all of our other little wooden gods, evidently He's not the God at all. So we've lost confidence in their God. Look what happened. Whole nations were destroyed because of disobedience. Wow. That's kind of sad, isn't it? I say today, putting off, waiting till you're right, it just won't work. Today is the day of salvation. Obedience is so important to every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Don't wait to make yourself better. Call upon the Lord while you may be found. He said, I'll fight what? Your battles for you. So if you're going through situations where it just seems like there is no winning, there, as a child of God, you've already won it. You just need to exercise that faith. God's going to lead you right on through. Don't try to make your own path and your own way. He said, I'll go before you. Be open spiritually enough. Re reading in the Word of God, let the Spirit speak to you that you may follow in His footsteps and you will never be defeated. It will work out in your life and in your experience or maybe, you know, in your home, in your marriage, in your job, whatever it might be. Just don't get ahead of Him. Don't, when He says go, you go. When He says stop, you stop. He is the living water. Are you thirsty today? Are you really thirsty? Are you really hungry? And you want more? Then you're going to be coming to the well of the living water, aren't you? You're going to be coming every day. Pray every day. God, help me to be thirsty, as it were, for, for the Word. Thirsty, hungry for heaven to learn more about Jesus. I know you want to learn more. This is our way out. You will be defeated any other way but God's way. Let's choose God's way today. Let's not choose the enemy. The enemy says what? Number one, wait till I'm better. Wait till I'm better and then I'll come. And God says what? Come as you are. Let's pray about that, shall we, today? Let's kneel as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your precious word today. Thank you for reminding us that you're God. Thank you that you've also reminded us that you said you'd fight our battles for us. They're just overwhelming in this world. It seems like there's one after the other, but if we just... In faith, believe, present all these things before you. Call upon the name of Jesus while he may be found. We know that you will help. You will lead us on victoriously. Bless now we pray those who, we pray, have made a decision right now that they've been putting off for years of really committing to you until things were, were better, that they've decided by the grace of God today's the day. I'm going to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Let him fight for me. Let him stand in my behalf. And I pray, Lord, that you'll bless them accordingly, each one of us today. 
who have said deep within our hearts and our souls and our mind, Oh, Lord, I'm, whew, I'm thirsty today. Help me to drink from that river and that, that, from that rock flows that living water that I'll never thirst again. In Jesus' name we pray and it's for His sake. Amen.